What we do here is go back, 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 back. back. Out of your business podcast, Champ Ron coming to you on January the 3rd, the first episode of 2020. So glad to have you all here on what's been a pretty dreary and rainy Friday, uh, January the 3rd. Welcome to 2020. I'm your host, Champ Ron. This is the Mind of Your Business podcast. Give everybody a chance to uh, jump on. What's going on, Chris Eagleston, Lisa Ramos, what's going on? Good afternoon to y'all, man. Welcome to the new year. Hope that the holidays were enjoyable to you. Hope they were safe. Hope they were kind. Hope that you were all those things to your friends and family and to your community uh, as you enjoy the end of December. And I hope that all those goals that you wrote down and all the whiteboard sessions and everything that you did is bringing you to this very point where you're ready to get busy if you hadn't already. So what's going on? D. Young, how you doing? Vizo, what's going on, man? Good conversation there uh, with family, uh, Nidra, uh, all that other post, brother. Uh, Justin Spencer, what's up, brother? Doing big things, man. Had a big 2019, poised for a big 2020. Monique Russell, same for you. Shay, what's going on? Glad that y'all could jump in and uh, join today. Um, we're in what is now year three of the Money Your Business podcast. In August, we're going to hit three years. I'm not sure what episode we're going to be at, but thank you all for all your support. Thank you for those that have gone out on Apple Podcast and given us a five-star positive comment rating. I appreciate y'all. Thank y'all so much uh, for doing that. Roland, what's up, brother? How you doing? Jessica, what's going on? Jessica Wright. I'm going to call you this year Jessica Wright. I I made that one of my resolutions. I don't usually make resolutions, but all damn year last year, I told Jessica I was going to call her. I ain't done it yet. So that was one of my failures, one of my epic fails from 2019, as I never did call Jessica right about this business. But uh, we're definitely uh, going to connect on this year. So I've got it written down, Jessica. That was one of my goals. And uh, I am going to give you a call <laughs> at some point before December 31st, 2020. Gigi, what's up, girl? Let me um, jump right in. Since Gigi jumped in, I want to jump right in and share with you all, uh, MYB community. Marketing is extremely important to the level up of your business and to your personal brand. DR and Associates is available, and you can connect with them. It's in the show notes. You'll be able to link right with them on Facebook, and you can call them, 615-933-3681. Connect with Danielle McGee and her team at DR and Associates. Uh, She brings a wealth of experience. I've worked with her personally uh, for many years, and she's got the experience and the temperament to help you level up your business. Whatever your strategic goals are for your business, marketing is going to be a part of it. So either you're going to market to grow the business or you're going to market that you're going out of business and it's for sale. And then you're going to have the sad sob story. So avoid that. You need expertise in the room. No matter how much you feel like you have knowledge, how much you Google, that sort of thing, you need expertise in the room. And Danielle, uh, can provide that. So 615-933-3681. Connect with DR and Associates as soon as you can. Greg Bernard, what's going on, my brother? Thank you so much. I still got your shirts, man. I uh, appreciate your order. So I'll get with you whenever you're ready, brother, uh, yourself, and a few others that have ordered your shirts. Don't forget um, to order your shirts, the themybpodcast.com backslash shop. Uh, it's in the show notes, and you can order your There is No Business, like Minding Your Own. Make sure the world knows that you're an expert at minding your own business by having a T-shirt, seven different colors, nineteen ninety nine, dollars free shipping. Uh, place your order and do that for me, and I appreciate your support on that. Dominic Lawson, of course, the Startup Life podcast, get underway. They're going to be on KWAM, so you'll find them here. For those that are in Memphis, if you're not in Memphis, you can connect. Uh, KWAM, which is 990 AM. There's an FM station as well. Uh, you can find them online. They're going to be on 
Um, and Dominic, uh, we'll, we'll have him on where he can share the schedule. But for those that are already supporting the Startup Life, which is the flagship podcast of the Binge Podcast Network, the Binge. And so uh, definitely make sure that you check out Dominic Lawson on the Startup Life podcast. Get that wherever you get your pods, as well as all the great shows that are on the Binge Podcast Network. Nothing but buckets, let's be real, just blurting. Uh, all of them have new episodes that are out with great content that you need to make sure you check out wherever you get your pods, fam. So make sure that you all do that NYB community. So shout out to Dominic, uh, his great wife, Kendra. They're a great team, what they're doing with Al's LLC and the Startup Life podcast. Patrick, what's up? Wendell and Payne, thank you so much for your kind words during the holidays and hope that 2020 is off to a great start for you. Steve, what up? Thank you so much, man, for you all jumping on. As I mentioned earlier with the Bitch Podcast Network, they power this particular podcast and have now uh, going into the second year. You can expect more content and things like that at onabinge.com. All right, today is episode 123, and I want to jump right into today's topic. Um, before I do real quick, um, Olivia Magro, thank you so much again for sponsoring the last episode, the special episode with Tracy Moss that got really good feedback, uh, great downloads, and that's done very well. And shout out to Tracy for doing that down in Atlanta, uh, celebrity TV and film hairstylist. And definitely excited about what she's got coming up for 2020. I appreciate her taking time on a Saturday to do that interview this past Saturday. So thank you all ladies for, for doing that. Episode 123 is about building your consulting practice. I'm going to go through this. So today, I'm going to share my transition into CRA. Uh, for those that may not be aware, you know my background in banking, but you may be wondering with what I'm doing today, how I got into that. So I'm going to share that, and then I'm going to share five uh, key areas for you growing your consulting practice. So. Many of you have great skill sets in a lot of great areas, and you've considered going back and forth between you know, your workforce life and maybe starting up your consulting practice. Maybe you're looking to do it as a hybrid. Maybe you're looking to transition from the workplace to consulting exclusively. Whatever that is, I've got five very quick uh, areas that you should focus on when you're building your consulting practice. All right? So getting right into it with number one, all right? Well, before I get into number one, let me share my story real quick because I told y'all I was. So I was the VP of retail at a credit union here in Memphis. And January 4th at 3.45 p.m., I was told thanks but no thanks. It wasn't because of my performance. It wasn't because of my uh, lack of relationships. Uh, it wasn't because of anything other than that was the decision that was made um, from the level above mine. So that is a huge blow. If you think about that January 4th at 3.45 p.m., you know that that decision wasn't made uh, on January 4th. That decision was made actually more than likely the month before. Uh, decisions to move on from people aren't made four days into a year after you've already completed budget and that sort of thing. So. That's a huge blow that I got, but it, it led me to what I'm doing today, which is helping banks find investment opportunities in low to moderate income communities, uh, particularly in Midwest territory. In doing that, and as you develop your, your practice and you develop your, um, whether it's your self-employment or your business, um, I found that in doing so, it's very difficult. Um, for someone that had been in banking for 17 years, and I've got contacts all over this country, because uh, you got to remember, I worked for some of the super regional players. I, I traveled some. I, I went on merger acquisitions where I would go and train retail people and small business people on new systems and how to leverage the system within the sales process. And take the language from the system and be able to articulate that to a prospect or a customer. It's something that I did and, and specialized and did very well. In doing that, I gained a lot of great skill set and a lot of great contacts. But when I was on my own and now starting my own thing, I found that because I don't have the bank's brand 
with me. Uh, people took my calls when I was VP of retail, <laughs> okay? And when I was VP of retail, I had 96 employees, 10 branches, a 20 seat call center. People took my calls, all right? When I started out on my own, it wasn't that people didn't take my calls, but because I didn't have the title anymore, there was a different treatment, <laughs> right? As you could imagine, there was a different, you know, my calls now start going to voicemail. You know, my texts don't get responded to because I hadn't, in some people's mind, I had nothing to offer because I didn't have this title. The fortunate thing was I never built myself off my title. Okay, even in the workplace. So in building your consulting practice, for many of you that have great skill set in what you do and you've amassed and you've reached certain levels of title within our organization, that in itself will not transition to your consulting practice. What's going to transition is the relationships that you've built based on what you've done and what you've accomplished outside of your just having the title. So title respect is not going to be enough. So my number one thing for helping you build your consulting practice is why you? That's the question you have to answer. I see many people on my timeline, many people that I talked with and consult with, they don't do a great job of explaining the why you. What's your credibility? All right? Because the first thing you remember, consulting is based on expertise. You're providing an expertise to someone else whether it's another person, it's a group of people, it's an organization of people. You're providing an expertise in an area that they have an issue with that's been identified that I'll share with more in just a second. But that area has been identified and you're being brought in to help solidify that because the existing core of the organization or the person or whoever doesn't have that expertise and either doesn't have the time or won't make the time or won't make the investment to gather the expertise themselves. Because they're not willing to do that, they outsource that like anything else. All right. So that's where your, your core, your value is. But you have to begin with your why you. That's something that you've got to define that for yourself constantly as you evolve is why you. What's your value proposition? And so it's not just your passion. A lot of people have uh, energy, they have passion, but they don't have credibility. And like I told you on a previous episode, this is going to be the year of accountability. This is going to be the year of receipts. People are going to want to know uh, that what you have is really what you have, and what it is is what it is. So make sure that you answer is number one, MYB, answer why you? What's your credibility? So what have you done? So if you ask me that, it's not just I've been doing something for X number of years. I've always given the analogy that you can, if me and you are driving and we're gonna leave Memphis, Tennessee and we're gonna go to California, me having drove for a car for 50 years don't mean nothing if we go in the wrong direction. If we leave Memphis and we go east on I-40 and we're supposed to be going to California and we start going east, and you fall asleep and you wake up and, it, and you see a sign that says, welcome to Virginia. You're going to have some questions for me because we're heading in the wrong direction. How long I, I've been driving the car and how long ago it was since I got my license won't matter. Right. So it's the same thing. What's your credibility? What have you done? So for me, I've, I mentioned earlier about working in merger acquisitions. I have opened what's referred to as de novo branches, which are brand new branches for an organization. Everything that goes into opening a new branch. Um, I have, between Memphis, D.C., and Seattle, I have worked on retail teams, worked on retail projects, whether it's to add automation and using technology not to replace people, but to enhance um, people interactions and to take away mundane tasks so people can focus on the primary task. That's what technology is used for, from my opinion. So I've done that in my banking career. I leveled up. I went through the management training program. I was a small business banker, so I provided resources, deposits, cash management, things like that for uh, many small businesses that I'm still in touch with, some that are still in business, some that are, are not, some that have transitioned to different areas. So I've done this in a documented fashion with several different institutions. So that's my credibility. So when I walk in the door, 
and I've identified a problem within an organization, that's what it comes from. That's why they call me. That's why they keep the meeting with me. It's because these are the things that I've done and these are things that I'm continuing to learn. And I'll get to that one of the other um, keys. But your number one key is make sure you define who, you know, why you, what's your credibility, and make sure you can articulate that in a concise but detailed enough that a person can understand and, and respect that. And if you don't do that, if you're just off of passion and you just love to hear yourself speak, that's how it's going to come off. As someone that just loves to hear themselves talk, someone that just loves to go live on social media and blah, blah, blah. That's not going to get it popping. All right. What's going to get it popping is your credibility. So make sure if you're consulting on, you know, we talked about Danielle earlier on marketing. You know, she's one of the few who has gone through the Google program and been certified with Google in this area. You know, that's a credibility factor. If you're consulting on leadership, what have you led? Who have you led? And what were the results of you leading? If you can't articulate that or you leave that up to assumption, it's going to be hard to gain traction. You know, if you, you know, so whatever it is that you are looking to tackle from a consulting standpoint, financial, uh, marketing, uh, warehousing, distribution, whatever it is, where's your credibility piece in that? Make sure that you know that. Um, two, the second key area that I bring to your attention in YB is what is the problem? So one of the things that happens when, you know, with what I do is you have to identify a problem. When a bank has a CRA issue, typically what happens is they struggle with finding opportunities in low to moderate income areas. They're not short of opportunities in the gated communities with, you know, everybody that's got first world problems, right? They're more concerned about, um, you know, different things that aren't everyday struggles. Nothing against that, but um, banks solicit deposits and resources from a community holistically, not just from certain areas, not just from the, the blue blood area or not just from the gated community, the whole community. So they have a responsibility then to invest in the entire community. And so I help them do that. And Senior Crime Stoppers is um, a component that allows them to be able to do that while protecting low to moderate income seniors who have banked with them in many cases, have banked with them for many years. Many of these banks are built off the incomes and the revenues that are generated from seniors. These are the people that opened the accounts 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago that are still there, right? These are the folks that borrowed money to start businesses. You think about it, a lot of the great generation people who came out of World War II are the people that borrowed the money to start the businesses, some that are still in existence today. So protecting those people is an opportunity. So you've got to identify the problem. That's number two. So when you're talking with a potential prospect or with a prospect or a potential client, listen. Listen for the problem. Ask the open-ended questions. It's not just about you speaking. It's not just about you worrying about price and cost and all that. We'll get to that in a second. But it might be you got to make sure that you are in, in full understanding of what the problem and let the customer express that to you. Don't go in assuming what the problem is because you looked at this and looked at that. You may be good to be able to recognize some things where there are issues, but let them tell you that and then you share your feedback. So when I sit down with a bank, I'm not telling them, I'm listening, right? And what I'm listening for are tree, uh, key trigger words. I'm listening to uh, words along the lines of, you know, where they've had challenges, what's their strategy, how did they develop the strategy, who's involved in making decisions, what is the impact if they don't act? And that's something else that you got. Don't be afraid to ask that question. What is the impact if you do nothing? And make them think about that. Ron, what is the impact? If you, if you don't make an investment this year, if you don't tackle your marketing strategy this year, if you don't make your financial plan this year, if um, you don't address the bottleneck in the assembly line, 
what is the impact to you? What is the impact to your employees? What is the impact to the organization? What is the impact to the community? Make them answer that. If you're talking with an individual, they're doing real estate. What is the impact if you don't do it? I, I can share with you what it, what it can do for you if you do do it. What is the impact if you don't do it? Corey, what's up? Tara, what's going on? Gil Carter, what's up? Brian, Scott Kenny, SK, what's going on, my brother? Reginald, what's up, brother? Nidra, what's going on? It's just Sarah Rebizo. That's a great conversation we had on the generations. Um, so I, I love being I have those good, candid, but uh, intelligent conversations. So Nidra's yeah, family, she goes back a long way, helped keep a lot of us in line. Joyce, what's going on? Cardi, what's up, girl? Todd, Gwen, what's up, girl? Gwen knows what I'm talking about. Gwen worked with me in banking, and she's still in banking, longtime banking professional, young lady, too. Gwen might be about 23, 24. I think she probably started in banking when she's about five years old, broke all the child labor laws. Jamisha, what's up, uh, Sora? <laughs> what's going on? Jamisha, keep us all laughing on the timeline. D. Wallace, what's going on, man? David Wallace, what's up, brother? But is that making sense to y'all? Number two is you've got to identify the problem. So even as you're putting your consulting practice together or you're in the midst of it, make sure you're really good at identifying and recognizing and respecting the problem so that you can get to the solutions. You know, but if you don't understand the problem or you assume the problem, that's going to hurt you for what's going to be for number three when I get to number three here in a second. But you've got to be able to identify the problem and you've got to make it stick. One of the things that makes people buy is the thorn, I call it the thorn in the side. There's something that's pricky. When you sit down in the chair, if there's something that's pricky you, it makes you uncomfortable. It's gonna make you eventually at some point get up and see what it is. You gotta address it. What that thorn that's in the side is the problem. Once you identify the problem and you ask that question, uh, Jack, what is the impact if you don't do it? If you don't act right now, pack. And then, be, then shut up. A lot of times what, as a consultant, you do too much talking. Some of y'all talk yourselves out of everything. Shut up. Ask the question, then shut up. And listen. Not with what you're anticipating them going to say, but listen to what they say, how they say it. What's their, their mood? If you're on the phone with them, say that and shut up. If you need to repeat yourself, then do that. But ask them what the impact is and restate the problem to them and get them to confirm that yes, that is the issue. Because the worst thing you can do is do a consulting contract or do something with somebody, go do something, and then that not be what the issue really is. Or you address part of an issue, but you don't solve it holistically. So number two is, again, make sure that you understand what the problem is so that you can jot down and be prepared to execute on the proper solutions going back to your credibility and restate the value proposition. Number three, this is the thing that gets a lot of people on the consulting standpoint. Is people ask me all the time, well, Ron, what, what should I charge? All right. And 2018 and 2019 were big. Y'all wore out the whole know your worth, you know, uh, memes and comments and Everybody now thinks they're supposed to charge $1,000 an hour for everything they do because they know their worth. I'm going to break this down to y'all in YB community. Knowing your worth doesn't mean it's high. That's going to upset some of y'all. Knowing your worth doesn't mean that your worth is high. A case in point, I know my worth. There are things that my wife does that I'm not good at. All right. So my worth in that particular area is not high. It's not about how I think. Of, it's not that I think of myself any lower. It's just my worth in a particular situation is not high. I'm not good at going and sitting in a room and typing all day. My worth is not that. So I'm going to have a low worth if I'm in that role, if I'm in that position. My best role is networking, uh, working with people, and inspiring and influencing performance through people 
through processes and through the automation of a process to make things easier on people. That's what I'm great at. So that's where my worth is high. So in my, in my practice, my worth is high because the skill set that I bring is high, right? Your skill set and everything may not be high. And so the whole know your worth thing has thrown some people off because some of y'all are just throwing out prices just because you think you can or because someone else says, you know, they're only going to do it for 500. You're know your worth. You just run out and just do it for $500 and you don't have the same value. Because again, you haven't gone back to number one, which is who are you and why you? That's what ties now into number three, which is tying value to the economics. Okay? So people ask, well, how do you know how much to charge? Here's my rule of thumb for those that are in the consulting practice. This is me. Someone else may tell you different. Um, if you were working a job and you were making Let's just say you were making $30 an hour, okay, as an example. So you were a salaried employee, but if you break that salary down, you were at $30 an hour. I typically charge as a consultant, because keep in mind, you don't have the benefits, you don't have the corporate backing, you don't have any of those resources that you had uh, when you worked for a conglomerate, when you worked for a job, okay, when you were in the workforce. So now that you, they're – a, someone else is paying for the expertise that you put years into to doing in many cases right so if you made thirty dollars an hour I typically um, triple my rate when I was working so if you're working thirty dollars an hour you times that times three all right now you're in that ninety to a hundred dollars an hour range all right so it just depends on where you work. So $30 an hour, I'm not sure what that computes to, to a salary that may be, I don't know, let's just say that's $50,000 a year, all right? So if you triple that, you wanna to try to get to somewhere around 180,000 in revenue. To do that, then you've gotta triple your rate. So take your $30 an hour now, if that's where you are, whatever it is, 25, could be 75, whatever it is, take that in YB, triple it that's your consulting rate right that's a basis now you got to have flexibility because you can't be dogmatic in that because it also goes back to how you establish your consulting practice who is your target audience what is your industry what is your field what is the problem or problems that you solve and how willing are you, the people that are in your target uh, approach your target market willing to pay to have that resolved how are they doing that today who's doing that for them today right so there's a lot of variables that's why that's why I don't do podcast episodes about how to do something because that's the one that's dogmatic I can't tell you how to do that you know, everybody that's listening to this podcast is going to have a different walk with different skill sets there are too many variables for me to tell you um, dogmatically how to do something because how to open how to do your your consulting practice is going to vary based on your mindset based on uh, your, your what capital you have available based on uh, your uh, mindset towards reaching out to people and connecting and you know what your market is there, there's so many variables so I'm telling you or share with you five areas that have helped me and that can help you build but there's many others, obviously, than these five, all right? Tying your value to your economics, that's what I use as a rule of thumb. I had other people share that with me. Take your salary, whether right now or wherever you were at your max, triple it. That's your rate. So, you know, now if you're $30 an hour, again, you're at 90. Let's just say you round that up. You're $100 an hour if you're going to do hourly fee. Some people do flat fee. If you take the flat fee route, then you take the number of hours that it's going to take to do a particular task to get it from soup to nuts. So um, if you know, the company you're consulting has whatever issue and it's going to take you know, 80 hours to 
get from where it is today to where they want it to be. All right. So now you're doing your 80 hours times your $100 an hour. That's $8,000. All right. That's what you're presenting. So that's you tying your value to the economics of how you got to where you are and the training that you bring to the table. Don't waver. I see people on social media whining all the time about people not accepting their pricing. Listen, they're not your target. Everybody's not. I don't care if you're selling toilet paper. Yes, everybody needs to wipe their ass. Everybody's not wiping their ass with your toilet paper. All right? If they don't, if that's not for them, then and if you're constantly seeing that, then you may have to make adjustments. And you have to determine what what's valuable to you. Is doing business valuable and making something? Or are you going to hold out and you just have to have this set price? So don't let the know your worth thought cause you to be broke <laughs> or cause you not do no business. All right? Be careful with that. Shay Robinson, what's up, girl? Sandra, what's up? Daniel Hodges, he knows what I'm talking about. What's up? Chambers, what's up, girl? Yolanda, Eric Johnson, what's up, brother? How you doing? So that's number three. Number four is a uh, key area in building your consulting practice is because you don't have the training, you don't you don't have the conglomerate, you're not going to training classes, there's no boss um, or no supervisor that's saying, hey, you need to go to this training, you need to go to that training. You have to make sure you continue that because take me for example even though i was in banking for over 17 years it evolves right it changes and you've got to be up on those changes and up on as needs evolve from your target market what you don't want to do is become stale because you don't i don't want to fix in my 17 years experience and then that's it so for the rest of life i'm just hanging on this 17 years i've got to continue to be proactive about training and development for myself and anybody else I bring on as part of my practice. So make sure that you don't miss out on that particular piece of NYB. It's very critical that you continue to develop yourself. You continue to go to classes. You continue to read materials. You continue to attend conferences. You know, I attend conferences and things like that, not solely always for business development purposes, but also for education. I want to hear what bankers are learning, right? I want to hear how they're addressing today's topics, not topics from yesterday, per se. For I'll give you a case example. Um, Illinois just, you know, they had the law for uh, legalizing marijuana in Illinois. I'm going to Illinois in two weeks. I need to learn how that's impacting the banking industry and how bankers are feeling about it, even though it's very early. What are they feeling? What are, they, are people coming in wanting to open accounts? Do they have cash in the business? Are existing business owners that they're already banking entering the industry? What's the impact of that? How is that impacting their strategy, particularly their CRA? Are they picking up areas that now they're doing business in that they weren't before? So again, that's going back to what I was talking about earlier. That's my listening and understanding number two, which was their problem, okay? But number four is continue the training. YouTube, if you go back and get certifications, whatever that is, continue to do training. Ask your, your customers that you do do business with for feedback. That's gonna help you learn too. Go back and ask them, why did they do business with you? Make them overtly state that. So you can understand what went into their mindset, they say yes. So you know what to look for with the next prospect to hopefully guide them to a yes. We often want to know the negative. We want to know why people don't do stuff. But we also need to know why people do it. Even if someone does it, don't assume that they just loved it. Why did they do it? Don't assume that. Let them overtly tell you that and express that to you. But ongoing training is going to be critical. So whatever it is, I don't care how great of it at it you are or you were, you have to continue to learn. And you get that infrastructure often when you're working for a reasonable size company. You won't necessarily have that if you're not. So don't forget that. Number five is it might have been one of the most critical ones that I jotted down, which is 
when you're starting your consulting practice, you're often, a lot of times you go beyond the island. Um, again, you're not going to have not just the corporate support, but there may not be others within your uh, immediate network that um, understand or are part of what you're doing. So your mindset's going to be critical. You always have to challenge your mindset. You have to make sure that you're spending time on yourself and on your practice, understanding, again, what's that value, what's the mindset, what's the grind work you're willing to do. So when you're building your consulting practice, it's sales. you got to make a lot of calls. I told you earlier, when I was VP of retail, folks accepted my call when I called. I didn't have to leave too many messages, right? When I'm outside of that and I don't have that title, it's different. And I learned that really quick. So I had to be diligent, steadfast, and tenaciously focused that everyone that I called was not a target all the time. And even if they were a target, the timing wasn't there. They weren't ready to commit to solving the problem. They weren't ready to commit to me solving the problem, whatever that is. Keep going. Typically, I've got to make, you know, I've got to connect with about seven to eight banks or people to get a yes. That's typically, you know, sometimes it runs longer, sometimes it's shorter. But that's typically the the progression. That's the rate. So and when I say yes, that's yes to a meeting. That's not yes to even um, a transaction taking place. That's just yes to get a, a meeting, a face to face meeting or a conference call. So I've got to be constantly, you know, reaching out to them, you know, who within the bank do I need to talk to? You have to know that within, you know, the co if you're dealing with companies or your business to business or whatever, um, even within the family, who am I talking to? Who's my target? And then how am I getting my information in front of them? You know, I do mailers. Shout out to Erica Dallas. She helped me last year do my prospect letter. Um, so how are you connecting with those people? What do you get in front of them? You know, are you having to do a lot of cold calling? Um, are you able to leverage a association and things like that to get warm calls like I do? State banking associations are great. The ones that are positioned and have the mindset and willingness to help me get in front of bankers. Because I'll tell you right now, picking up the phone and calling a bank CEO, getting him on the phone or her on the phone is almost a fool's errand. And then once you do get them on the phone, them listening to you for longer than about 30 seconds, again, a fool's errand. However, if you've got a warm intro from a referral with even within a banking association, that goes a long way to getting their attention and getting their ear. So the same may be for your industry as well, but don't miss on the art of making contacts and then following up. That's going to be critical in your consulting practice and not getting down about people not returning your calls, people not returning your emails, people dragging their feet. You know, that's going to happen. And, and if, you're, if you're targeting the right people, that can get reduced. What happens is when you're just a free-for-all, and this, this kills consulting practice, when you want to be everything to everybody, and you want to try to help your friends that are starting businesses. You want to, you can't be everything. You won't be everything to everybody in YB. You're not. Even in marketing, yes, every business should market, should market. But that doesn't mean your service is targeted and specific, you know, specific to everybody at every business in every industry. Possibly, but you have to, you you have limited time and resource, so you can't be everything to everybody. You've got to decide that. Here's who want, this is the type of business, this is the type of industry, this is the type of business owner, this is the stage of business that they're in, and these are the folks that I'm going after that I'm targeting. Not everybody on my timeline, not everybody on IG, not every, you know, not everybody that walks up to me in the grocery store, but these are the people that I want to do business with, and then this is the mindset I've got to identify those people, and then do I understand the psychology of those persons? How do they think? What makes them make decisions? What do they factor in? That comes from experience. That comes from doing it. There's no list you're going to buy for that. That's just grind work. It just is. So there's no secret sauce. There's no secret formula. There's no magic beans. It's grind work. You got to get up in the day and say, okay, by the end of today, 
I'm going to uh, dial 40 numbers of these targets. I'm targeting, you know, for me, I'm targeting banks between three, roughly 300 million in assets and 5 billion. Are their banks smaller? Yes. Are their banks bigger? Best believe. But that's my, that's my swim lane. 300 million to 5 billion. All right. Who am I talking to at the bank? The CFO, the CRA officer, the CEO, the community development manager, the chief lending officer. There's many different positions. Am I targeting and talking to the right people who can make decisions? No neglect to anybody else, but talking to people who don't aren't involved in the decision making process is not going to be the best use of your time. Unless they have influence. One area with bank consulting is the executive admin wields a lot of power and a lot of companies they do the executive admin who's the admin to the CEO or to the CFO or both he or she can have a lot of influence on who they meet with and how much attention they give to you or to an area so keep that in mind but make sure that you have the proper mindset you know, because you know, the other four things that I mentioned are all cool. They all are a part of it, NYB, but you gotta have the mindset. You gotta be willing to get out there and grind. You got this is a crude analogy, but you gotta get your nose bloodied a little bit. All right. And they say experience is the best teacher. You gotta get that nose bloodied up a little bit. You gotta get out there. Most people, about 80% of people, don't show up. They don't. Sometimes you win by default. I, I found myself, I won things by default because I was the one that showed up. I was willing to get in there and take a fist to the nose or to the teeth. What is that? Well, you know, getting hung up on. Um, people saying they want to meet and then cancel. Um, people looking at the pricing and, you know, um, they commit one moment, they don't the next. Whatever it is, I'm not mad at that. People are, gonna make, people are, are, are nothing but big variables. There's very few things fixed with people. They go breathe. If they live in, they go breathe. Their heart go beat. They either go tell the truth, they go lie. <laughs> you know what I mean? They go show up or they not. People are huge variables. You're right. The, the one thing that you can control that you can fix is your effort. You hear that in sports, it's the same thing in business. Your effort. So number one was why you, you got to legitimize yourself. Number two, Where's the problem? What is the problem? How did the problem come about? Can you identify it? Can you articulate it? Can you get the uh, prospect or the existing customer to confirm it? And then can you execute on the strategies? Three, are you tying the value, what you're charging and the value that you bring to your customers or prospects economics? Remember, if you work a job and you transition into it or you once worked a job or whatever, you were making thirty dollars an hour, triple it. That's your rate, and you can either do about an hour or have a flat rate. Number four, you got to have the ongoing training. You got to keep developing yourself. You got to keep pushing the envelope. And as things change, as technology comes in, as mindsets change, as buying habits change, you got to be rolling with the change. Because what happens is you don't want to be the young person that becomes the stale old person. The people that you know you you talking about now you become don't do that <laughs> you know what i mean don't do that don't become that person because you will you stay around long enough young people this is the one fallacy that young people have right now is they think they're always going to be young you know folk that's 25 think they'll always be 25 and that's not the case 25 will be one day if you stay around long enough you'll be 35 you keep waking up uh in the morning and going to bed at night one day you're going to be 45 then you go do, keep doing that some more, you'll be 55. You do it some more, you'll be 65. Right? You, at that time, you got to still continue to develop your skill set. You got to continue to sharpen your, short, your sword and make sure that your, your shield is right. And then last, like you say, getting the mindset. If you don't have the mindset, the other four become the moot points. All right? So I hope this is helping you all. Uh, that are listening here, MYB, as you're building your consulting practice. This can be applied across many a myriad of different uh, areas of your life, personal and professional. But these are five things that I key in on uh, as I'm building mine. All right. So listen, 
Uh, for those here that are on Facebook, I, I appreciate y'all jumping in. Uh, let me shout out a few more folks. Um, Berlon, what's going on, brother? We need to get together uh, for sure. Kay, congratulations again uh, to you and the mister. Appreciate y'all uh, sharing that with us. And uh, for those that were hating, y'all know what y'all can go do. Um, <laughs> Whitney Jones, what's up, girl? How you doing? Kristen, how you doing? Angel, what's up? Nia, what's going on, girl? Happy New Year to you all. Curtis, what's going on? So I hope this has been helpful for y'all, NYB, here on episode number 123. Uh, share this with someone that is, you know, starting their consulting practice or they have goals for 2020. Uh, maybe these five key areas can help them. I, like, I'm hoping that they helped you all. Uh, we're going to come right back. Next week, I'm going to be episode 124. This year, I'm going to have guests going. But we're going to continue to build this thing. I've got opportunities in other markets here with the Mind of Your Business podcast that will come to fruition this year. I'm very excited about that and continue to build this. Y'all see where I am here on, uh, for those that are looking on Facebook, I'm just here in the office. You see behind me, I keep my basketball goal wherever I go. Um, you see that I've got the whiteboard. These are the things that I'm doing. Information that I'm converting to my ability to articulate that to help solve problems. That's all it is. No magic beans. There's no magic sauce. You know what I mean? And there, there's roadblocks along the way, but there's great joys as well. And you just ride it off. So listen, Champ Ron, the Mind of Your Business podcast. Subscribe, listen, share on all the uh, podcast platforms that are around there from YouTube to Apple to Spotify to iHeartRadio, whatever it is, Google. Definitely give a five-star rating and leave a positive review. That helps the show be able to grow. Don't forget about the T-shirts. Don't forget about DR and Associates that I mentioned earlier. Don't forget about uh, the Startup Life podcast and the Binge Podcast Network. And listen, you all, 2020 is underway. Get off to a great start. All right? Remember, the year of accountability. Get off to a great start. Don't accept nothing less. Don't accept nothing less and challenge your mindset, but don't accept nothing less than getting off to a great start. And if I could be a resource, Ron at the mybpodcast.com is my email address. Hit me up. I'd love to hear from you. If you got ideas for the podcast or you want to be a guest, um, hit me up there on that email address. I'd just love to hear from you. So listen, y'all enjoy the weekend. It's going to be a great one. Hopefully it'll stop raining here in Memphis. Hopefully the weather's nice wherever you are listening to this. Check out the links in the show notes, and I'll catch you on the next time. Champ Ron. What we do here is go back, 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 back. Kick those New Year's resolutions into gear at Old Navy with up to 50% off all Old Navy active right now. All your favorite active wear is on sale. From hoodies to sweatshirts to the new Elevate legging with Power Soft fabric. All Old Navy active for the family is up to 50% off with styles starting at just 8 bucks for adults, 6 bucks for kids. But you better get moving. This deal won't last long. It ends soon at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. Valid 1-2 to 1-9 excludes in-store clearance.